the guts and it's the glory A hundred stripes, a hundred stories It's the Pledge of Allegiance on the 4th of July It's them handwritten letters from home It's them sleepless nights alone It's his newborn baby he left with his wife Mr. Red, White and Blue To the swamps of Louisiana To the golden coast of California Uncle Sam's the only family he's got His purple heartbeat won't stop And his 18th birthday was the day he was born One of the greatest values of sports is that they provide us with people worthy of our admiration. People who work hard, who believe in themselves, and who are committed to doing their best. Men like Rocky Blyer. After being wounded in Vietnam, Blyer was classified as 40% disabled by the Veterans Administration. Everyone thought that his playing days were over. But slowly and painfully, he he rehabilitated himself, and he eventually helped the Steelers win four Super Bowls. Blyer never demanded respect from others, only an intense commitment from himself. As a halfback for the Pittsburgh Steelers, Rocky Blyer, number 20, helped his team win four world championships. But his toughest battle was fought in a distant arena, far from the cheering crowds of the NFL. In the rice paddies of Vietnam, Rocky Blyer learned that a real battlefield has no champions, only survivors. Gun. You could hear it in the distance, started to level the area, and all of a sudden I felt a thud in my left leg. And as I looked down, I, uh, I saw two little holes uh, in, in my uh, khakis. And then I could hear the, the guys hollering in the, in, the, in the wooded area, you know, there's one, you know, watch it. Damn it, boy, they got to go. Watch that one, watch it get Holy Christ, what's going on? They're everywhere. Now the helicopter comes in, the gunships come in, and they strafe the area with uh, rockets. Uh, the company medics now run around as best as he can. He gets hit. Radio man gets shot through the throat, and so he's out of action. We didn't know what we ran into, and so we set up a defensive position. So our commanding officer, Tom, was only about maybe six feet from me. He was out looking over the top of the ledge to see what was out there. And all of a sudden, just out of the corner of my eye, I saw this grenade from flying through the air and it hit him right on the back and it bounced off of him. It was almost like slow motion. The grenade just 
and it kept rolling right where it was. And in a matter of seconds, I had to decide which way to jump. And I went flying forward, and the grenade went off. Boom! Oh, I got dizzy and went blacked out for, for a minute. And, uh, and it had blown out this way, fortunately for me, because if it had blown up this way, I mean, I might not be sitting here talking to you at this point. Um, and so I caught some uh, coming up through my right foot. Dwyer spent six weeks in a Japanese hospital, dreaming of a future the doctors told him he would never have. So I said, we're back. I mean, my biggest concern is that I'd like to go back and play. I said, Dad, at this time, what's your prognosis? I said, well, I'll honestly rock there. I've seen the damage that has been done. He said, uh, the ability to run is, is gone. And I mean, you will not play professional football again. In the late autumn of 1969, Rocky returned to Pittsburgh. His foot was stitched and scarred, but his spirit was unmarked. I didn't want to get to a place in the future and say, you know, maybe I could. Maybe I could have if I would have. Maybe if I tried, I might have been able to play. I liked playing football. I liked what football gave me. At least I wanted to give it a shot. And so that if I got to the point and didn't make it, I never had to look back and say I didn't try. I would spend hours in that weight room just lifting, lifting, lifting until I could finally start running again. In 1970, Lyer reported to the Steelers training camp, but his future in football looked bleak. Rocky was so beat up that when he first tried to run up the, and down the field, you could just see that every step hurt him. And, you know, my thoughts then, I said, boy, why is this guy even trying to play this game? Because, you know, he's going to hurt himself worse. He's, uh, you know, he's just never going to be able to succeed. No one thought Rocky would make the team. Certainly not Chuck Knoll, the new head coach. There was no way Rocky could play, you know, in my view. In fact, I asked him at one stage to, uh, you know, I thought maybe it would be better if he had retired. Uh, I was crushed. I remember leaving practice and was driving up to the Green Tree where I had a, an apartment. I mean, tears were coming down my eyes. My world had just caved in. I, I, I didn't feel like there was no hope left. And it was something I couldn't control. I mean, maybe I would have felt better, you know, if I gave it my best shot and, and, and I had control over it. But I couldn't control because it because the foot didn't react the way I wanted to. Tony Parisi, our equipment manager, after talking with Ralph Berlin, our trainer, came to, uh, came to me and he said, uh, listen, he said, you really have to do something about this Rocky Blyer. He said, this kid is just killing himself. He said, he's not going to say anything to anybody. He says, but he's just suffering so much. He said, I, he's come to me at night and asked me to remake his shoe. He said, I put a special thing under his uh, instep, but he has nothing but scar tissue there. And uh, he said, it's just the most agonizing thing. He said, that kid cannot go through what he's doing. So that what we really did was put uh, Rocky on the injured reserve list, sent him to the doctors, and when our doctors operated on him, they actually found a piece of shrapnel in his foot that, uh, that had, was not able to be taken out at the time, and they removed the scar tissue, and uh, then the story, of course, is legendary, what Rocky did after that. The next year he comes back, and he's still not 100%, but he's able to run a little better. You just see a little bit of improvement. I still wouldn't have given him a nickel for his chances of ever succeeding. The following year he comes back, I mean, it was just phenomenal. The rate of improvement and how he had just conquered all odds. In 1974, after five years of rehabilitation, Blyer won a spot in the starting lineup and a place in the hearts of football fans everywhere. Everyone was inspired by the gutty young man whose hard work had made a dream come true. Straight ahead, will and determination put him squarely in the tradition of men who have been at the heart of winning teams. 
In each of his five years as a regular, the Steelers won the division championship. And in 1976, Rocky became only the fifth player in NFL history to gain 1,000 yards in a season after reaching the age of 30. In any field of human endeavor, whether it be art, science, or sports, we are apt to find at least one person who serves as an example of the triumph of the spirit. In this figure, we are able to find a measure of our own possibilities, instead of a reminder of our limitations. The NFL has its example. And even people there at the hospital thought he couldn't do it. But knowing the spirit of this young guy, I never got the impression that he wasn't going to play football again. If there's a similarity between what was going on with the Steelers at that time and what was going on with us, it's about perseverance. Whatever that quality is of never say die, seemingly against all odds. To live forever, you have to endure. No Steeler knows that better than Rocky Blyer. He isn't just lucky to be a four-time champion. He's lucky to be alive. Rocky Blyer gave it a great second and third effort. You helped so very much in bringing to the forefront a story about perseverance, about overcoming odds, and, and I think that's what the team did. The people here identified with that. You know, all we did was tell the story. You guys did, <laughs> did it, it, lived it, and made it happen. When I first came here, you did your first movie, yeah. uh, Night of the Living Dead. That was in 68, that was my rookie year. In 1968, Rocky was actually drafted twice. In January, he was fortunate to join the Steelers as a role player, right before their dynasty began. That December, he received a letter that changed his life. 1968 is the height of the war, and I get drafted after 11 games in the season. They needed bodies in Vietnam, and I was shipped over to Vietnam, and then spent four and a half months in country before um, I got wounded twice in the same day. The grenade went off. Caught me in the right foot and the right knee and the right thigh. I think anybody who gets into trouble, the first thing that they do is you look towards a good Lord, you know. If you can get me out of here, I'll do anything. Well, he must have taken me up on it because he got me out of there all right. To say he was unlikely to make it in professional football after that is an understatement. And I must confess, you know, I, I was a doubter even myself. After nearly having his leg amputated and being told he'd never play football again, Blyer's career came back from the dead. I started doing a heavy weightlifting program so that when I came back, I was in excellent shape. When you see the footage of Rocky working out so intensely. I like to think that we worked out that hard in a different way. We were always ready to do the heavy lifting in order to make our dream happen. The director of I'm Back, Mike Gornick, had to pull double duty as Rocky's stand-in. The opening scene is of me walking. Yeah, okay. your feet. Which is not me. Really? <laughs> it was the director. Ah, that, it was Mike. He, it was Mike that was doing it. <laughs> if you look carefully at his NFL Films footage, you can see that he has a little bit of a stumble to his step. In my poor method way of acting, I was trying to adopt some of that challenge that Rocky had. And failed. <laughs> Looks like that person is not an athlete. <laughs> I just want to let the audience know that that's not how I run. By 1974, Blyer completed his journey from the battlefield to the Steelers' starting backfield and ran for 65 yards in Super Bowl IX. To come back in Vietnam and to win the Super Bowl 
was a capsule of a football career. With the Steelers' second straight championship on the line, Rocky's heavy lifting paid off. Terry Bradshaw struck for one of the greatest plays in Super Bowl history. Lynn Swan had beaten Mark Washington again, and looking at the play from the end zone reveals why. Number 43, Cliff Harris, had safety blitz. He was chopped down by Rocky Breyer. His blitz unsuccessful. The Dallas secondary weakened. You go back and you say, you're just happy to be a part of whatever took place. And oh, to be there at the right time with a group of people that, you know, that had the same desires or dreams. And I think that becomes part of that legacy that continues. Oh.